today, Dr. Stephen Nor Norris, currently performance technical director for Swim Alberta. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Alberta, sports science, applied physiology. Uh, we were just talking about the, his uh, stomping ground at Lakehead University with a master's in science, applied physiology, and he started his uh, post-secondary, we'll call it the post-secondary uh, pathway back in at the Chelsea School of Human Movement. Uh, definitely a fixture in Canadian uh, sports system for 30 plus years, maybe a bit longer. Uh, Steve, Steve is a highly respected and valued leader in the high performance sport and long term development uh, fields. And we may be changing those uh, titles of sorts uh, as we go along. Uh, as always, he articulates so well. He's very engaging, definitely thought provoking and inspiring speaker. And uh you know, I have to say, Steve's been very much a mentor of mine. He, uh, back in the day, he asked me a very important question and probably one of the most difficult questions sometimes to answer. Why did they swim well? And uh, that always resonated me, with me. Um, so today's uh, title is definitely that thought provoking. He said, what if? What if? And uh, I think that leaves it well, somewhat fitting as we have our theme of reimagining Ontario swimming together, not so much of what was, but rather what could be or can be. And uh, I leave it at that. Stu will be helping moder moderating and uh, monitoring the questions. And then I'll come on at, uh, at the end uh, with a little bit of a, a follow-up and next, next uh, steps of messages. Steve, thank you very much for being here with us. Well, my pleasure, Dean. Thanks very much. Um, I'll come on to share my screen shortly, but I did want to thank Dean and Lindsay and Stu for all the help in keeping me on track. I'm notoriously scatterbrained and all over the place, so it's important to have good people really uh, working, working alongside with me. Otherwise, I tend to wander a little bit. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. I did want you to know that already, um, I believe Lindsay being so efficient that she is uploading PDF of the presentation for you. I do reference all my materials, um, so they, they are there for you. If it so happened that you do want a, a PowerPoint or an Apple Keynote version, I normally do everything in Keynote, I can get that to you. Um, I'm not averse to that. It's just easier to send a PDF um, across all platforms. It's just a big file because of some video and photographs. So I just want to make that very clear. I'm going to talk at you for about... Uh, 50 minutes, 55 minutes. I don't apologize for that. I'm an opinionated SOB and um, I reserve the right to be that way. But I do believe myself to be a lifelong learner. And in this increasingly polarized world, it's very important to be able to adapt one's own thinking, deal with one's own biases. And I, like anyone else, have those. Um, and be able to assimilate new information or differences of opinion into whatever I talk about, and particularly the most important skill, as I, as I talk to you coaches about this, is the ability to listen, listen and watch, and then incorporate that information. So I'm going to share my screen with you right now. Share screen. Yes, messy desktop, I did warn you. Okay, as um, Dean said, um, I really wanted to be very broad deliberately. I've looked at the itinerary of the other speakers, many of whom I know or have, have come across in, in my career and listened to or seen some of their work. And I, I think you're very fortunate um, to have such a wide array. Um, I certainly wouldn't expect anything less from Sim Ontario. You are the hotbed, as far as I'm concerned, of Canadian swimming. And um, not that the other provinces, including my own Alberta, um, needs to necessarily simply follow Swim on Ontario. But, you know, with the resources that you have, the mass around the Golden Horseshoe, you know, if you look at the um, main corridors of the 401 and, and so forth, um, these are very important, um, if you like, springboard power places for all sport in Ontario, but particularly for swimming. And so I take my opportunity to speak with you very, very seriously. 
And um, this aspect of what if really is about um, allowing yourselves the opportunity um, to really springboard forward over the next few years. And that's really going to be the focus. I'm certainly going to be very open with you about what we're doing in Alberta. People get scared at times or upset if one shares information. I'm not of that thought whatsoever, because at the end of the day, it's all about execution, not simply having ideas. Canada is in incredible at developing campaigns and building materials. But if you really, really want to have impact and do something, you've got to go beyond simply those first two steps and get into assessment, measurement, metrics, and then on into accountability. And those are the four critical steps if you ultimately want to have impact. And we can think of many organizations and instances that do the first two, but don't do the latter two, and then things fall by the wayside. So I've called it deliberately, what if? Now, obviously, we've been living through a very tough time over the last little while, and I'm not going to dwell on this other than to and not wishing to dismiss the incredible challenges, sorrow, loss that has taken place right across the world, but particularly, particularly for us here in Canada. And I don't want to um, undervalue that, but I do want to turn this around for us and start to talk about, well, this is also truly, truly a chance for us to reimagine, to recast, to reset what we're actually doing. Because unfortunately, we were dealing with the juggernaut of life. And often as not in that juggernaut, there is just these critical paths that have become entrenched in our behaviors. We've become victims, if you like, of not only um, positive tradition, but also negative traditions and ways of doing things. And it's often very difficult then to actually change. And the real challenge of, of not simply change, but having a mindset of continual evolution. You know, one of the things that we wrote in the original Canadian Sport for Life document was the concept of Kaizen the Japanese principle of continual improvement. And I really want to sort of brand that into, into your foreheads, Kaizen, continual improvement. How do you make sure that your program, your club, your thinking is better this season than it was last season and have that continual mindset? And remember all around us, things are changing. You know, every time I look in the mirror, you know, every morning I think, where did that debonair, you know, sort of attractive, intelligent young man go, you know, just disappears. We age over time. And so we evolve and therefore everything we do must evolve. The swimmers change over time. The rules change. Records keep changing. Technology is changing constantly around us. So we should, if you think about it, be well versed in evolution. But we're not. And once we get into institutions, we unfortunately run afoul of all sorts of behaviors that are often holding us back. Well, we have a chance right now as we start to reemerge from the constraints that we've been living under to think about things differently. Don't have to change absolutely everything, but if you take a really good scan of your environment, your landscape, and you're prepared to work with each other, I will underscore that, work with, it, with, it, with, it, with each other. You have a chance to really, really develop something that you will be proud of. This quote from Wells Coates, he was the inventor of the transistor radio back around sort of the early part of the, night of the 20th century. He said this, we must remember that the past is not always behind us, but more often in front of us blocking our way. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll repeat that. We must remember that the past is not always behind us, but more often in front of us, blocking our way. And isn't that true? The shackles, you know, the the albatross around our neck. You know, it's almost as though we're constantly wearing concrete boots and we're walking through a quagmire of quicksand as we move through time. Well, we cannot allow ourselves to think that way. And if you actually look at his transistor radio, if you go back to this, this was probably the state of the art of a wireless transistor radio back in about 1934, the Eco AD65. And it had to wait for a number of things. That shell casing was made of that. And I can't remember the name of the actual material, but it's sort of a 
it's a forerunner of the plastics, but you know, you can see instantly, it's quite recognizable. It's got clearly the dial that you can see. There are a couple of knobs that change this, and there's typically one that will move the dial, one that will control the volume, and we see a speaker right in the center. So it's instantly recognizable. But if we move forward and we rush through to probably the state of the art right now, even though it came out a couple of years ago, and they have made a couple of slight modifications to this one. Okay, so this is a digital, um, I'll call it a transistor radio, but it's not really in the same um, vein a transistor other than its size. And so the Sanjin came out in about 2018, but it's instantly recognizable in the same way. It now has a digital dial, still has the speaker. It has uh, a number now of computerized presets. We can change the band. We scan with buttons rather than a knob. It has an on-off switch that's clearly available. And we even use icons to represent certain things on it from the volume to the alarm to even um, a sleep mode that can be built in it. Interestingly, when they did their research, the customers or the prospective clients, as they were rapidly changing this model, still wanted a volume dial. So a little bit of a throwback still. So couldn't quite leave behind absolutely everything, but certainly move the technology forward. And I want us to consider that. So when I talk about reimagining, it's not necessarily that you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to change everything, but you have to think how you can advance and maybe you have an idea of what that future might look like, not too far in advance, although we often talk about stretch targets, but what's truly attainable? What do you want to accomplish by Christmas of this year? What do you want to do by the end of the season? So by the time July, August rolls around of 2022, and then what about the following season, the season beyond that? And where can you aim to? And what would be the priority things to do? Maybe the one or two things that you really need to start to think about for this season, one of which you can get underway before Christmas. And remember that the campaign, the materials, the way you're going to assess your performance and who is accountable for actually doing these things. So the dashboard, although it's come under quite a lot of negative scrutiny of late, I still believe in the concept for you. And I want you to think about a dashboard as being a way of focusing your aspect. You can peel back the layers behind any one of the icons or any one of the elements on a dashboard to give you more information. But a dashboard at any one moment in time should give you the pertinent information to make the right decision. That's the critical thing. The information to consider, to uh, mull over, that leads you to make the right decision or the best possible option for decisions to reduce your error. And I know when you have Dr. Wrigley speak to you about effectiveness and efficiency in swimming, he will talk to you about you know, reducing the error, lessening the mistakes to improve your effectiveness and efficiency in terms of swimming performance. So a couple of things for you, as I just want to stress that, what really is on your dashboard between now and December of this year? What really are you focusing on, given where you're arriving from, given the, I won't say necessarily relaxation in constraints, but the ever-changing landscape of the constraints due to the health and economic situation that we're in? Then what about the rest of the season as you move into a new year? Can you new, use the fact of a new year as a springboard moment to crystallize positive thinking within your membership or certainly across all the clubs of Ontario, for Swim Ontario, for Ontario as a whole? So can you use even some outside components to draw the line in the sand to springboard forward? And I use the word springboard as a mentor of mine who unfortunately passed away at the beginning of this month, Derek Snelling, and I do want to recognize the influence that he had on me. And one of the things he always used to talk to myself and David Smith about was springboard moments. So I want you to think about that. How do you leap forward? What type of elements can you use to really push yourselves and leap to a new level, whether it's a swimmer breaking through, I don't know, a younger swimmer breaking through the 60 second mark for the 100 meter freestyle as a, as a young female, for example, and then using that as a springboard so that they, they don't even see 59 and 58 for very long because they've leapt forward to 57 seconds and so forth. And then what about as we move into the next full season and the season beyond that, and then perhaps having a picture of what the longer term looks like? I hope I really 
get that point to resonate with you. I'm going to be very honest about some things we're working on now in Alberta, because I want to leave some seeds for you to think about. One of the biggest things that we are going after is retention and recruitment. We are down in our registration levels like many sports. Some of the information coming out of the United States is dire. You know, depending on the sport, 30 to 40 percent drop in registrations across various sports as we came through the summer months, a time when because of the outdoors, you might expect there to be, you know, a reasonable rebound in, in many sports. And to some degree, it certainly has happened. Golf, for example, has been very fortunate throughout the last two years in both Canada and the United States because of being outside, the ability to socially distance, et cetera, et cetera. And they've done a good job of really using it as a springboard opportunity to get kids interested and active and then on into the older age groups and into seniors as well. So for us, we're really going after this aspect at, for the remainder of the 2021 through the next season for sure and putting in place some campaigns and materials and then how we assess our impact in actually doing that and who's going to actually do that. One of the things I would suggest to you is examine your atmosphere within your club. What truly is your attractiveness? What's the excitement quotient, if you like? Because remember, as students of sport and students of swimming, the number one reason why kids and youth stay in sport is having fun. The number one reason for getting out of sport and physical activity is not having fun. So why would they come to you? And remember, right now, because of the startup in all these other activities, from the arts to academia to physical activity and sport, we are in a highly competitive market to grab the attention of these youngsters and their parents, of course. A highly competitive market. What about the kids that perhaps had been in swimming and have fallen by the wayside? They didn't necessarily have quite the investment you thought that would hold them, maybe a whole bunch of previously nine, 10, 11 year olds. And are they back as 12, 13 and 14 year olds? We certainly in Alberta are starting to notice a little bit of a hole in our age groups, a hole that unless we do something about it, will now exist for a decade or so until that whole sway of youngsters has moved through the system. We can't afford that. We can't afford that for our province and we can't afford it for our country. What are your entry points and mechanisms? You want to talk about a tradition, but we often have very restrictive ways of getting into age group swimming. Why is that? Is it because we're blinkered? Oh, you've got to start swimming young. Well, really, how young? And how late can you come into swimming? And is it because at times we, we handicap ourselves because we take a bunch of six to eight year olds into our club and we say we've got room for, I don't know, 30 of them, right? And we're gonna swim that group four times a week for a couple of years. Well, really, what's the, what's the increase in investment for having a six year old swim four times a week or twice a week? And could you actually double the amount of six-year-olds if you had in your club? Instead of having one group of 20 to 30, maybe having two groups of 20 to 30. So now you have 60 in that age group, but they're only swimming twice a week each. So you're using the same amount of pool time. And remember, if you really understand advancement in anything, one of the critical things is to understand, you know, really appropriate athlete development and the pathway, at least hypothetically. And at what point do you start to move people on and add more and more resources, more and more swim time to them? If you look at any of the research on talent to development or development of youngsters, what you want to be able to look at is those that if you threw them in a swimming pool are sort of naturally good at sculling. They stay on the surface. They don't drown. I'm joking. Compared to those that perhaps you've had in swimming for a little while and they're able to pick up things very quickly and therefore they progress very quickly. Again, if you read the research, you'll see that one of the most important things is not necessarily in the early age swimming very fast necessarily. If you have a big pool of swimmers, it's the ones that swim most effectively. So do you have markers of efficiency and effectiveness in your biomechanic assessment, in your qualitative assessment of swimmers? Or are you simply losing using the final lag metric of performance? which might lead you down a bit of a back alley, a red herring road for a little while. Theoretical numbers at each bandwidth of the club. 
What are your numbers? What can you do to push the envelope? Can you get more water time? Do you need more water time? Are there other ways of improving? We've seen the effect of appropriate and effective dry land throughout the last 20 months, if you've been really paying attention and people getting to fine performances with really relatively historically little swim time. The use of the calendar, seasons, events, identity, the brand, the media, how do you use it to tell your story effectively so that your light bulb really shines in a mass of light bulbs of attractiveness? And how can the NSO and PSO assist? Really, what can you do if you are prepared to work together? Other things that we're working on, we've got really four big areas and one area that we've realized that we need to spend some attention on. So we're going after certainly looking very clearly at how we train and our competition. We've gone through a massive competition review because we realized that the competition calendar we were following in Alberta did not make sense for about 98 to 99% of our swimmers. We were tied into, and it's not a complaint overall, it's just to say, understand your core business and what you're eventually trying to do that we were basically adapting our calendar to fit almost the international calendar and certainly the calendar for swimming Canada's top echelon of swimmers. Great. But understand this, 98 to 99% of our swimmers were not going to be following that calendar because they wouldn't meet the entry requirements. So therefore, what does our domestic calendar look like that is going to progress all our swimmers through? effectively and then those that have to step away from our provincial calendar to the national calendar and beyond including clearly defined um uh, landmark if you like blue ribboned invitationals like your um oji for example it's a very critical competition that alberta will certainly support in the future when when we're able to come and swim at that event but that's still for a sort of top echelon of swimmers that we would send to gradually, albeit at an age group level. The other thing is the opportunity to train best on best. This then opens the, the challenge of actually getting people to have open minds and coaches, often as not, I'm sorry, don't always work together that effectively. I mentioned best on best training and bringing maybe five swimmers from here and three swimmers from there and four swimmers to there for a weekend of systematic training with their coaches, I believe strongly in the coach-athlete tandem, and then going back to their respective clubs, but having had a springboard moment, you'd think I was the devil incarnate for suggesting these things. But if we want to improve and we're prepared to look at other pursuits of excellence, we would understand that that is just regular behavior, not a threat. The next thing, is coach investment, for me, ultimately, absolutely critical. We live and die by the level of our coach understanding, effectiveness and implementation of knowledge, number one. This can be in formal settings, informal settings, mentorship, tied around competition, training camps, a multitude of things, learning from other pursuits, not necessarily swimming, but certainly other sports, corporations, the military, space exploration, doesn't really matter. But can we keep learning and can we provide coaches with the type of knowledge that resonates with them, that then they can invest in their programs and challenge each other? Huge area as far as I'm concerned. And making that sacrosanct. So even in tough times, we don't diminish that pursuit. Swimmer investment from direct resources to help them deal with the costs of training and competition through to, again, particularly with coach athlete tandem opportunities, can we find springboard moments? And of course, getting after these two things, coach investment and swimmer investment, and putting them into that first aspect of training and competition opportunities. Can we find series of competitions where we can really send coaches and athletes to those to learn? And when those coaches come back from those opportunities, we expect them to reinvest in the coaching community back in Alberta. 
So if we're going to fund you to go to Mare and Nostrum tour, for example, in Europe in the spring of each year, we would expect a coach to come back and tell us his or her learnings to share these things. The same with the ISL. In fact, I have a meeting coming up um, as soon as this is finished. I'm going to drive into Calgary. I live in Cochrane just outside. I'm going to meet with Dave Johnson and we're going to do a debrief from him having just returned from the main segment of the International Swimming League, just as we did last uh, November. Special projects. One of the things that I was able to discuss with my ED, Cheryl Humphreys, who's been a fantastic support to me over my two years in this role, is that I wanted to have not a slush fund, but I wanted an ability within our budget, like any organization constricted by our budget realistically, that with sound rationale, I could tap into to do something that might suddenly appear. Like last year, there was the possibility of Wayne Goldsmith coming into Eastern Canada. I think he was coming into Ontario um, for the conference. It didn't actually happen at the time, but we immediately had a chat with Ontario and with Wayne and said, if you are coming, would it be possible, since you're already over here, for us to fly you out to the West and buy literally buy three or four more days of you and share you with BC and Saskatchewan and ourselves and have that springboard moment. So that would be an opportunity that suddenly came. Another special project might be that came from a, say, a dual role with coach and swimmer investment, whereby a number of years ago, I had a, a national team biathlete, a young lady who was, you know, getting into the top 40 regularly, into the top 30, aspiring to be in the top 20. And she was struggling with, shooting under pressure and biathlon is an interesting sport because you have to ski your brains out cross country um in freestyle so the diagonal stride and then calm yourself and come into the shooting range and shoot in two positions on a loop standing and prone and then go back and 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 keep skiing so you can imagine having to bring the breathing rate down and your your heart rate down and compose yourself to be able to shoot at this particular target understanding that if you miss you then have to do a penalty loop of skiing so you add more physicality and more time to your eventual placement. So what I was able to do, I met with the, the um, if you like, the SWAT team for the Calgary Police Service, and I met with their commander, spent a, a morning with him and told him the challenge. And we came up with a little curriculum for a day where this particular athlete would be embedded within this particular group. She would do all the training with them, go out on the sorties during the during the morning and mid-afternoon, do everything, the physical training, the prep work, go out and do a particular task, come back and debrief on that and finish the day with them shooting on their live shooting range and then debrief after that. So we took her through this entire process, process with her coach. So that would be a special project. How did we facilitate that happening? And then finally, I do want to talk about other significant adults. These are an adult population that we rarely truly invest in, your parents. What does the handout look like for new parents into your club or organization look like? Really, what's the on-ramping procedure? What's the on-ramping procedure for the coming period of time of training this year? Have you told the parents, this is what we're going to aim for. We know we have a lot of uncertainty, but this is what we're going to do. And this is how we'd like you to help. What about officials? One of the things we've tied with our competition calendar review is talking to our officials, because I'll be quite honest, love them to death. They volunteer a huge amount of time. They're very good at what they do. But age appropriateness and the level of competition needs to be taken into account. We do not need a FINA level or even a Swimming Canada level of competition officials for a bunch of 10 and unders at an in-club meet nor do we need the same type of policing of that event we want to have. Remember, ultimately, we want to um, reinforce belief and build confidence in our youngsters. And we can't necessarily just come down and, and fill the whole of our sport with penalties and rewards. We want to make sure we're getting our messages across, but to do it appropriately. So we've had lots of talks with our officials as to how can we have rigor around the quality of the swimming event, but how can we gradually progress this over time so that we teach our swimmers and our coaches about the process and we get them ready for the next level. In other words, how do you take a nine-year-old 
over the year and get them ready to be 10? How do you take a 12 year old and get them ready to be 13 and so forth and so forth? How do you take them from the sort of B level, introductory level of provincial swimming and get them ready to go to the next level of provincial swimming or going from provincials to junior nationals or to senior nationals and so forth? It's all about progression. So these are the focuses for us. So I now want to spend clearly some time talking about you. Because just as I said, coaching investment is absolutely crucial. Now, I really follow the views of Jean Cote at Queen's University, Professor Jean Cote, and his push around transformational types of leadership, transformational types of coaching, where, yes, you're a leader, but you have to be able to learn how to harness your skills and the skills of an incredibly important group of people who surround you, other coaches, officials, parents, God knows what the skill set of all your parents actually are. But do you actually bother to talk to them? Do you canvas them? What kind of help are you going to get? And surely you have come some kind of succession planning for some of your key boards and committees of your organizations to make sure you harness the skill sets of these individuals rather than simply looking at the lag metric or the emotional attachment of having a kid in the program. And you start thinking about the program as a whole, which also means that you have to think about yours as well as the club's overarching guiding principles. These are the three to seven, typically sort of five things that really shape every decision you make. And I'm not here to tell you what those are. You know, it's important for you to really think about what are those what are the things that define you and your organization? You can think of them as being your underlying values, but I want to really operationalize these. So these are actually seen in the decisions that you make. Which comes to this aspect around you, and I really want you to invest some time in thinking about these. There's an excellent little Harvard Business Review. They put out a series of little books every so often, but there's an excellent one that did a sort of review, a number of different essays, Um, to read about on this particular topic. And there are a number of different categories within this, and I'm just gonna choose um, these five for you to think about in a nested fashion from the top of the page to the bottom. First off is self-awareness, which is really understanding yourself. What's and all, being absolutely honest with yourself. What is my skill set? What are the things I like doing? What are the things I'm not very good at? And what are the things I don't like doing. And some of those can be interrelated, of course. It is vital that you know that because you have a big, if you're building a team and you want to be able to achieve something, then you need to be able to harness your best and other people's best and steer away from what you're all not very good at and find people to fill those gaps. So self-awareness is the first rung on the ladder. Know if you get het up after a swimmer's bad swim and how you're gonna handle that, which leads us to the next one. Once you've got an understanding of who and what you are, is self-regulation. There is nothing wrong with emotion. Nothing wrong. The issue is how you harness those, how you handle that. How do you handle elation? How do you handle, you know, um, anger, perhaps, or disappointment? And how do you handle that after you've had an opportunity to think about it a bit? Do you give yourself the opportunity to have this little mantra, breathe, think, breathe, act. In other words, allow yourself some time to assimilate information and calm yourself down and get to an understanding, then make a decision of how you're going to act, uh, sorry, how you're going to think about it in a very sensible way. Breathe again to make sure that you give yourself a chance to reflect before you actually act. And then finally, understanding motivation, not only of yourself, but obviously everyone around you, but certainly it's important to understand what motivates you. You don't want to be in a situation where you're surrounded in an environment which constantly demotivates you. The only option you have there, as far as I'm concerned, is to change that environment, or from a negative point of view, if it's really something you can't do, then you have to remove yourself and find a situation that you can. But I'm all about really trying to improve yourself and the situation. But you also have to understand the motivation of everyone else around you. You have to have, therefore, some empathy, something that is sadly lacking as we watch the world become increasingly polarized. And it is interesting because we've very clearly seen, even around COVID, very polarized views, views that make your 
blood boil, that your hair stands on end on the back of your neck or on your forearms. And yet truly, truly, if you're going to have the emotional intelligence, you need to have respect for the other opinion, even if you don't agree with it, so that you are able to breathe, think, breathe, act, and present a position with some degree of empathy for the other one, even though you may think they are 100% incorrect, which leads to social skills. And some people will be better than this at others. Some people have the gift of the gab, et cetera, et cetera. But the ability to talk and you as coaches must be great communicators. There's a great line in Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth Bennett says to Fitzwilliam Darcy about the aspect of practicing because he reveals himself surprisingly to her by saying that he was not very good at talking to people that he didn't know or didn't know very well. And she says to him to take his aunt's advice and practice. So perhaps it takes practice to go into those situations in which you're typically uncomfortable, which leads me to this environment, the environment. Now, this is specifically your environment, but then gradually as the sort of concentric circles expand, you can move into other domains. But if you look at your environment, this is your club, including the facilities you use, around which you may have, you think, little to no direct impact. But I would challenge you on that. How do you really build a good relationship with the facilities that you use? And you're undoubtedly coming, going to come across some, let's say, sticky people at times. But how do you deal with them? Perhaps you're not the front person to always talk with certain people. Maybe there are other people in your enclave that might be better at some of these things. Maybe it's something that is delegated to a board member as opposed to the coaching staff, because perhaps you're emotionally a little bit too close to dealing with people. I don't know. What I'm saying to you, it's important that you have the difficult conversations as well as the easy ones. And you build this environment. What does it look like? How do you stand out from the rest? We're all swimming, but what makes one club different from the other? You know, I deal a lot with other sports, but if I walked you into FC Barcelona versus Manchester United, they all play soccer. It's instantly recognisable if you saw both teams playing, but they certainly play very differently. And although you might walk into their dressing rooms and they will look somewhat similar. You've all seen the hockey dressing rooms and they will look very similar, but there are very different elements within it, the way the equipment's laid out. If you came into the Team Canada dressing room for hockey, whether it's the home base at Windsport in Calgary or when we're on the road, in the middle of the dressing room for Team Canada, whether it's men, women or the sledge team playing, embroidered into the centre of the of the oval of the dressing room with all the stalls around the outside and doors leading off into video rooms and the, and the changing rooms in the dry land area, we have the Hockey Canada logo. And one of the environmental factors is no one, no one is allowed to walk across the logo. No one, except the person that cleans and vacuums the carpet, no one else. And we have a piece of carpet with the logo on that no matter where we're playing in Canada or the rest of the world, we take that piece of, of carpet and we put it in our dressing room. It's home from home, but it's part of our environment. It's part of making that place belong to us. And therefore, what does your squad or the various squads that you have, do they each have their own flavour? Is there something that the younger kids aspire to, to get to the next level? Oh, I want to be in that squad because of, I don't know what it might be. Maybe it's a t-shirt, maybe it's a specific logo for that particular group. It's a name, something aspirational that they want to aspire towards. And then how do you train? To be quite blunt, if I walked into a swim meet in Ontario and your club came in and I started to see them warm up from how they walk onto the deck to their pre-water routine to in-water routine to what they do afterwards to where they sit I should be able to say ah, oh, I know that that is a swim club from I don't know let's say Etobicoke or Oakville or Thunder Bay I know because of the way they behave and when you race exactly the same I should be able to tell from perhaps even the way you execute strokes 
the starts and turns, how the clubs support each other, how the kids that are there support each other, or are they all off in that cloud cuckoo land and don't recognise when one of their teammates is swimming, or how do the relays behave? So these are things that I really want you to consider. And this leads to this whole new area of obviously, or relatively new area, epigenetics, where we all understand the influence of things like our genetic makeup but understand that the environment can cause massive changes overall to our overall behavior sets and actually how we tick. Vital for us to understand that. So the things I'm talking to you about are not airy fairy, they're not pie in the sky elements. These, interesting enough, are more under your control than anything else, because you ultimately as the coach and your staff and your club do control the environment. Even though you're in a facility not owned by you, when you are in it, you make it yours. Coco Chanel said this, in order to be irreplaceable, one must always be different. So how are you different? Are you just another swimming club? And I could be anywhere in the world, but how are you different? What's the strange attractor about your environment? Remember, Chanel is an amazing company. They launched this particular perfume back in 21 and, and then understood the need to develop something iconic around it. This bottle with it's an amazing sort of art deco stopper that hasn't changed actually across all these years, despite the fact that everything around it, they have changed as they've evolved from their marketing ploy to the way it's manufactured, to the way it's distributed, it's blockchain, but the iconic components haven't changed, just like that transistor radium. She actually said this, and it's something I want you to consider as I force you to think about that dashboard. Always remove, always strip down, never add. Now you may think, Steve, you've told us about evolution. So yes, as you evolve, it means that you don't suddenly go from five things on your dashboard to 10. You need five. The only thing is something's got to give if you have a plausible reason to want to incorporate something to your dashboard. If you're going to truly go from five to six, so add and break this rule, you better have a very clear definitive motive for actually doing that. Otherwise, the reality should be on the dashboard. You replace something with something new. And maybe the thing that you've replaced now becomes, you know, an element that is behind a new logo, a new um, icon on your dashboard. Always remove, always strip down, never add, because life is so complex. Coaches, as indeed in many pursuits, we keep adding more and more stuff, you keep thinking about it, but we haven't changed what you've got to do. Help kids to swim fast or faster. That's the goal. And ultimately all you really need are the following things. You need, a swimming pool, you don't even need a swimming pool. You need a body of water, let's call it that. Helpful with a swimming pool, but a body of water, a stopwatch, and a creative coach that knows what he or she is doing. That's it. Strip down. We keep adding things to that. We do weird and wonderful things in energy systems. Good grief, I'm a physiologist, and I can tell you I can't believe how complex sports make it. And they all use different jargon. Then we add biomechanics and psychology and equipment. And we do different sets all the time and never can compare because one minute we do a set on full stroke and then we do it with fins or paddles or, you know, whatever it might be. And we do it long course and short course. Keep it simple. Always remove, always strip down, never add. Get to the things that are important and understand that. And then where do you add at certain times in the calendar or multi-year calendar or on the pathway of hypothetical development for a swimmer or a group of swimmers? Understand what your signature processes are. This is a better phrase than best practice as far as I'm concerned. I want you to think of it this way. The signature processes are the things that really belong to you and your club. I talked about the warm up. I talked about the way you race. I talked about attitude. I talked about your uniform, whatever it might be, even your underlying business model for your club or situation. The signature process is a bit like the following, because as I said there's loads of swimming clubs all doing roughly the same pursuit as you. 
But if I asked all of you on listening to me right now to take a piece of paper and write your signature on that piece of paper, you would all go through basically the same process. But interestingly enough, you would all end up with something very different from each other and something that was highly individualistic and belonged to you and no one else. And so that's what I mean by signature processes. The process, fundamentally very similar, the end result quite different. And ultimately, as people look at it, it's you, it's your club, it's your environment. So I want you to think about what that might be. I put this in. So down at the bottom, you'll see there in blue is the actual website. Came from the BBC just last week, actually. And um, it was an excellent little article, and I'd like you to have a chance to read it, about the surprising power of daily rituals. As I've talked before, tradition can be, can be both negative and, and um, yet positive. What we want to do is be able to harness powerful rituals. And you want to become known for that. They become your signature processes. So this is an excellent little article to give you a sort of, of a lead into it, a little paperback that you might want to consider, The Power of Habit, which was um, released a number of years ago. is an excellent read and certainly one of the books that I'd recommend in the library of any coach or high performance director that I work with, The Power of Habit. So let's talk about swimming. So. I've alluded to this aspect of the process, understanding the pathway. I put the the in uh, quotation marks um, because it's not as though it's a single pathway. We try to provide a golden thread. So you've seen the evolution of um, Canadian sport for life, long-term athlete development, and, and again, the continually evolution into appropriate athlete development to give you a guide, a guiding framework, understanding that while it's true that we all go through the same sort of phases of life as depicted by this particular series of silhouettes, we all go through this. And although this is a gender specific one, I would be able to show you silhouettes of the female form, for example. The fact is the thing that differentiates us is, is, is to the extent of impact of each of these phases we all end up with different heights, different overall body shapes, different uh, cognitive capabilities, different skill sets, etc. But we've gone through this. One thing that is different between us are the kinetics of this, you know, the, the speed at which people appear in at the early stage of puberty compared to those that are a little bit later, the speed at which people reach early adulthood, etc, etc. So the kinetics change in terms of both the dimension of the time of change, as well as the magnitude of impact of that particular phase. But the process is there. And the challenge for us and what makes age group mentoring, age group teaching, age group coaching in any endeavor very difficult is that although there is the golden thread of the particular process, you're not dealing with apples and apples, you're dealing with apples and bananas and kiwi, kiwi fruit and pineapples. Everyone is different. That's what makes it your challenge, which means that at no point in the process is say, for example, the environment and the training identical from one age group to the next. Wouldn't make sense. Why would you do a bunch of anaerobic glycolytic work with a bunch of prepubescents knowing full well that they don't have the enzymatic activity to take advantage of that type of training? What about knowing the fact that you want to build a, a, a strong heart with both large dimensions in terms of its chambers, but also very strong wall thickness? Well, how do you get to that? And at what points do you actually build that type of activity? What about building that resilience into the swimmer? Where does that occur? Is that something that occurs over a 10 to 15 year period? Or is it something that you can turn around relatively quickly? Understanding the process and understanding the difference. It makes your life very difficult. But it's certainly, if I looked at your programs, recognizing that if we're looking at one age group versus another, I'd expect to see differences that are appropriate for that particular age group, including the type of training, the type of competition, and the type of special projects even. Which leads me to this, and you'll hear many coaches, I've had the great fortune to work with Mike Babcock around Team Canada over a couple of Olympics. And he has always talked about building the human first, the athlete second, and the hockey player third in that order. And I'd like to extend that to you in building the young humans you're dealing with into good athletes, good fundamental athletes, 
into great swimmers and then ultimately being good ambassadors for the sport and ultimately being great Canadians. You as coaches, the humanistic side, what are the pursuits outside of swimming that help shape you? Certainly perhaps established bias, but also your ability to understand those biases. And so you become a true student of life. You can become a, certainly a student of sport and certainly a student of the sport of swimming. And I'm not just talking about being able to reel, reel off split times and, and finish times and stroke rates. I mean, I'm really talking about being a true student of the sport. Leading you to be a coach so that you can take that knowledge and actually implement it effectively and then be a strong ambassador within your community, both within your club and your group of assistant coaches, as well as into the coach um, segment of Swim Ontario and then ultimately, hopefully, to Canada and the rest of the world. And I know you may sound think that sounds rather euphemistic, but I am deadly serious when I say that. Often we're just isolated islands existing rather than having that interaction. And we don't do that enough. I look forward for the opportunity for us to have true face-to-face -face fireside chats, to have debate in the lulls between competition so that we can really talk with each other. The swimming point, as I said, is reducing it to the simple elements. We tend to, except for open water, have relatively controlled environments. The pool temperature has to be this, the depth of water is this, the lane lines look like this, the length of the pool looks like this, the lighting has to look like this, and the level of adjudication, officialdom, has to look like this. And there's a process of major events from the time the swimmer moves into the building, does the warm up, gets dry again, to the process getting ready to their race. Dry land, we've seen massive evolution and sinking in dry land over these last two years. I hope it has challenged you all because I, for one, you know, have been very concerned about how narrow at times we get when we look at athleticism in general and then the specificity of into swimming and how we try to force square pegs into round holes all the time. I want you to think and be creative. Beg, borrow, steal. I don't care where your ideas come from, ultimately, as long as you're able to implement effectively for things that, that will work for you. Now, I'm a physiologist, but I will tell you, I come from a school of thought where you cannot separate the physiology from the biomechanics. They are inextricably linked. And then ultimately, they're all wrapped up in this hopefully resilient shell of psychology. And I know you're going to have Dr. Wrigley speaking with you and you have um, um, other excellent uh, biomechanists available to you in Ontario, Ryan, for example, who um, I, I, I have um, utmost respect for, for both of them. And we actually just have had Alan speaking with our coaches in Alberta for two segments of our relatively short um, uh, conference just held last week. Biomechanics, not a subject to be afraid of since it's the most important ultimately for us. It's the form of how we swim. How Well, when I say we, I obviously mean your swimmers and ultimately dealing with how can we make our swimmers most effective in terms of their propulsion? How can they, we help them to be most efficient in their swimming biomechanics for them so that they have some recognizable form of each of the strokes that their starts are most effective for them? their turns, et cetera, et cetera. And that ultimately we have swimmers who are bold, okay, in their swimming, who truly are um, courageous in their swimming, that you don't inadvertently teach advanced tactical things to a bunch of age group swimmers when you're really wanting them to be courageous and bold. There's a time and place perhaps for a conservative approach to racing, perhaps. But I'd rather know where a swimmer fails in a race then think they got to the end of the pool and they probably swam within their true capability because we never saw it. It was a criticism I had when I really did my review of Alberta swimming a couple of years ago. I, I didn't really know how fast we could swim because we were swimming always these relatively advanced ways of trying to win the race rather than actually seeing what a bunch of age group swimmers could really do. So I never knew if they failed at the 90 meter mark of 100 or the 80 meter mark or the 75% mark of a 400 or whatever it might be by being bold 
And if you use the competition calendar wisely for those opportunities to use them for learning, remember competition is the highest form of training, okay? As well as obviously the highest form of monitoring. So you can get a lot of information out of racing. And there's a time and place that you really wanna to get to the performance level as opposed to learn about what you've been doing in training. Another aspect that we've really concentrated on in Alberta and, and will continue is mental health and wellness. We were pushed into it a little bit at the start by the fact of what was going on. To deal with youngsters and coaches and parents dealing with uncertainty and having resilience to still be swimming collective, but understanding we might not be swimming at all through to maybe swimming a little bit. And how were we still going to be organizations who were still focused on swimming? And that took a lot of thought. And so we used an iceberg analogy. We recognized that mental health and wellness was this iceberg where typically we were dealing with the bit above the surface of the iceberg, you know, all the performance stuff, you know, positive self-talk, being confident, um, um, being able to regulate our emotions effectively, all those type of things, resilience in the race, fighting hard, all those things that we think about for performance. But underneath the surface, by far the largest part component was being a stable, healthy person on the mental level, having that confidence, having that belief, dealing with everything in life that often might get dragged to the swimming pool. And it goes for us as well, us significant adults. So we've really striven and formed a partnership with the Canadian Sport Institute in, uh, in Calgary to take some of their leadership to help us. We weren't experts in that area. And then to really be able to spread that province wide, listen to our coaches, listen to our swimmers. And we ran a whole series of webinars by age group to the swimmers because it was no good necessarily presenting basic information in a way that would present it to our 16 and above swimmers to our 10 and unders. And then to the parents and involving them and having sessions for parents to let them know what we were talking to the kids about, but also how could we help the parents as well, as well as obviously our coaches. We took a broad strategy around what we were swimming. So we would tend to try to get the province onto a similar timetable and think about the types of things we were doing, not stifling the creativity of our coaches, but saying if we're getting a handle on what we're doing so that we can recognize these positives and negatives, let's roughly have a similar type of calendar, the type of work we were doing, what we were aiming for. And these are typical examples of the sort of last two macros that we're dealing with. And we're obviously into the second one at the moment and what we're trying to do. SA obviously stands for Swim Alberta and SC for Swimming Canada. Just broad strokes. And we introduced a number of things. We introduced some challenge swims, you know, our maximal VO2 max type swimming kind of sucked 400 meters. So we really got after that over the last couple of years and we put out challenges and we would rank the kids and give them some rewards by single age group all the way down. We've done a swimming passport where we would encourage clubs to send in times across a whole milieu of swimming events. OK, where we would choose what the sort of five or six events were. Everyone would come in and it gave me an idea of how we were doing overall as a province. And we were just trying to tie it in, not to be manipulative, but to make sure that we have an understanding because I could tell you as the performance, supposedly technical lead, I had no clue what we were doing as a province, no clue. And we were certainly doing all things very differently. Then we'd turn up at a meet and wonder why maybe we got to some fast swims or maybe we didn't get to some fast swims because we didn't know. I couldn't even have a reasonable conversation with coaches because we weren't even talking the same language. So one of the things over time is to make sure that we talk the same language. And it's far easier for me to understand the language of coaches, okay? Then the coaches necessarily all try to learn exactly what I'm talking about. Now you may think, well, that's easy, Steve. You're just one person. We can all assimilate to you, but you have to talk the language that we all collectively understand. So that's been an important process after the little, last little while. Now, as I roll on to finish here for you, other significant adults. You as being a leader. But remember, our primary goal is to help kids swim fast and swim faster over time and effectively, and to do it obviously within the rules. So there's a lot of people we need to talk to, your other coaches. 
and they may have ideas. They may have a greater knowledge. You might have a coach that's really good on the psychological side or the biomechanical or starts or turns or a particular stroke or distance, males versus females, whatever it might be. What about you as an important conduit through to your board of directors so they clearly understand, so they're on the same page? Or to key members of that board that perhaps you interact very carefully with or, or more often than not? What about the facilities? Where at times, maybe in multi-use facilities, you can be at odds with the multi-use facilities because you have to understand what makes them tick and the pressures on them, even though you're coming to it with a very sort of polarized view. Having that empathy to understand how you can work together more effectively. Ultimately, you still have to solve the challenge for yourself, but can you do it with people as opposed to simply on your own? I'm very concerned about this aspect, and that's the business of swimming in the country. And I've been talking to Dean and some of the other technical leads and also to my ED and to Swimming Canada about the fact that we, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we do these technical conferences, but we've never really had a conference on the business of swimming in Canada. And one of the things that so alarmed me, and I was ignorant of it, I hadn't really thought about it too much. Well, I had a bit, but not too much. But when COVID hit, as indeed with many other provinces, our clubs were in serious trouble. Their financial models were instable, unstable. They had, they had precious little resources. The cash flow was really tied to not only membership, but ongoing delivery of a particular service that they'd conditioned their audience, particularly the major significant adults, adults, typically parents, to, to understand, pay for a service, ongoing. So we, I found the fragility of some clubs very alarming. It really hit our summer clubs, but it hit some of our smaller clubs and particularly clubs that really had no access to swimming pools because of decisions beyond their control, both from made by the government of Alberta and then the municipalities that often own the facilities. So we have to have a discussion as far as I'm concerned about what are the possible array of business models across the country. And I'm not going to dwell on that at the moment, but we need to think about these type of things. How do you future proof your organization, at least from a financial stability point of view? Which leads me to this. Ultimately, it comes down to people. I've been guilty in the past of building some Taj Mahal facilities, mainly because people provided the money, built a you know, close to $300 million high performance training center for the winter sports here in Calgary. But the reality is that building would not or does not come alive until you populate that amazing building with critical people, the people that can run the building and look after it, the people that can, can really as a human resource look after the technical staff in that building, the technical staff that can design amazing programs world leading programs and then deliver them in the places. And often we go the reverse. We build the place, we think about some programs and then we populate the pool with people. Ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. We need to understand that our human resource is our most precious resource. And that's even coming from an Albertan dealing with the oil and gas sector. People, people, programs and places, which means you clearly have to, and I'm gonna stress this to you as coaches, need to understand and shout from the rooftops and collectively get everyone behind and understand what is your fundamental purpose of this club, of this squad, of this group, whatever it might be, it nests under that central purpose. And this aspect, because I'm kind of fed up with that, everyone produces their sort of strategic plan and their mission and vision and all these type of things. Well, don't simply have a mission. By all means, paint it up on the wall, okay? You really need to show the world you are on a mission and live it. Don't simply have it, which leads to this one, even more so, live your strategy, don't simply have one. So here's your mission, your vision, you fundamentally all understand the first thing, the primary reason, why you exist at the purpose, but your strategy, I should be able to see it lived every day. I should even be able to come into your coaches, update meetings and know 
because you almost start with always the same thing. It becomes part of that ritual, reminding us why you exist and you live it. Live it. The core of your club, its identity. And this thing, we rely heavily in swimming, as indeed most things to do with kids in the country and many organisations, on volunteers. And I'm not slagging volunteers. Vital, vital. I was just talking to the PGA of America on this, and they rely, we just did the Ryder Cup. Huge amount of volunteers involved in that. But as soon as they put on the logo, the Ryder Cup and everything on, they are representatives of that organisation. Anytime you give someone the shirt and they've got your logo on, they now, to anyone else looking at them, reflect that organisation, which means that your on-ramping of your volunteers needs to clearly underscore the purpose of the organisation, what your guiding principles are, your values, if you like, and what is their specific role. So there's no sort of role creep in the entity. They know what they can do because volunteerism is not an excuse for poor performance. And even more important, not an excuse when dealing with children and youth because it's their lives, not ours as the adults, their lives. Remember, you're taking that eight-year-old and getting them ready to be nine and wanting to come back to be nine in your organization, in your environment, all the way through that conveyor belt. And at the very least, my goal for any age group organization is the kids that start with you in that catchment period between say, six to 12 years of age or whatever it might be, they are with you at least until the end of high school, at least. So you have much more of a sort of oblong rectangle of participation rather than the typical pyramid. And they should be able to look back on their exposure, their, their experience with you and the organization through the years, through maybe a decade of their lives and be able to say, you know what? I had a good time and I learned a lot, independent of their performance level, independent of that. I learned a lot and I had a great time. Now I'm gonna play you this video. Eddie Pinera, I've given you the website. This is a phenomenal video. He has a series of them and a great website. And uh, I, I implore you to go and have a look at some of his videos. If you can afford him, get him in to speak. Maybe it's something we should do as a, as a collective. He's a, he's a world renowned resource in this particular area. It's called A Wolf Among Sheep. At the, towards the end of the video, he asks a question and you have to listen for it. He asks a very specific question around that title. And then he makes a statement after it where he asks you the question and then he says something along the lines, verbat not quite verbatim, then live appropriately because it's your choice and you have a choice as to what you do. Eddie Pinero. He said I'd never get to this, but here I stand. Be warned that success is unlikely, that victory is improbable, and maybe so. But if this was for everyone, I wouldn't want it. They pointed to their own limitations and proclaimed them to be mine. But that's the thing about limits. They'll exist wherever you place them, and I have placed mine behind me. See, human beings make things unnecessarily complicated. Instead of drawing a direct line from point A to point B, we create 100 reasons why it's too hard, too tough. We construct distractions. There is no hard, there is no easy. There is a goal, the price that must be paid, and the eyes observing from a distance, wondering just maybe if they can do the same. The same goes that a wolf need not concern himself with the opinions of sheep, that those who watch and admire are often the first to throw stones, to criticize, to condemn. But listening to them contradicts the very thing that gives the wolf its power, its strength.
His ascent is threatening, not because he is like everyone else, but because he dares to be different. There will be a point when the mountains tower over you, the oceans obstruct your way, and the masses tell you no. Perfect. It's not a decision that involves debate. This is no democracy. This is a promise unfolding before your very eyes. This is truth, the new reality. It's about embracing what makes you different, not hiding from it. I'm fighting for separation, walking into what most avoid in pursuit of a return that most can only dream of. And as far as I'm concerned, you can either do the same or spend your life criticizing and wishing that you did. Sheep stay within the confines of what they know, angry at those who left, who wanted more, yet angrier at themselves for staying right where they are. This is all we get. One rodeo, one opportunity. So before you make your next move, look hard at your reflection and ask yourself, are you a wolf? Or a sheep. Live accordingly. Are you a wolf or a sheep? Live accordingly. Jeff Bezos said this recently. Work hard, have fun, and make history. Thank you very much for listening. Okay. Well, that was great, Steve, as always. Uh, Stu, do we have any questions? Uh, not at this point. Well, let me say this, everyone. Um, you know, we're all here, we're in Canada. We're getting used to the electronic world. So as far as I'm concerned, um, you can send questions into Dean, Lindsay, or Stu, or whomever, and, and oh, touch wood, I'm not going anywhere. Um, I do have email. I speak with Dean relatively regularly. One thing that's really happened, I think, as a collective technical group across the country, we've, we've come together more often, and Dean has actually led a lot of that um, aspect. So we talk typically at least every month and have uh, uh, interim levels of conversation about a number of things. Um, so, you know, if you have any questions, I would say um, we're here. We really are here. And all the technical leads that I know across the country take their roles very responsibly and very seriously. And, and I'm not going to shy away from this. My job, as indeed the other technical leads, is to push you, push, push, push as hard as we possibly can. But in that is listening to you and having a rule that even though you may not want to put your hand up, particularly in a collective, I, I certainly believe that no question is, is um, I don't know what I would say, too stupid. I know people feel self-conscious. No, if you have a question, then it's absolutely the responsibility of us to either answer it or point you in the right direction. And just on that note, I have a little rule that I learned a long time ago, and I call it the three phone call rule. And it's this, we all have our sort of collection of people that we often talk to, we rely on, they're our mentors. And so my view is if I have a question and I don't know, I can't find it out that easily, or I don't trust an information source, I know who I pick up the phone to the first time. And I know that sort of, if you like, my ring of adjunct faculty, if you like, I know that they are either going to be able to answer it because I know them, or they're going to be able to point me to the person that does within their circle, because now we're expanding it out exponentially. You're, you're resourceless. So that's the second phone call. If that person doesn't know or they have to lead me to a third phone call, then basically they're not at fault. So if I have to go to the third phone call, I probably wasn't in touch in the first place with the topic and had failed in being a student of the sport. So my view, if I can underscore this, is you want to ask a question, ask it. Build that resource 
from books to the internet to people around you and then know that you can rely on them to get you to the answer that you need and more importantly because here's the real game we're in it's not simply about making the right decision it's about making the right decision as fast as possible as fast as possible because time stands still for nobody so Steve, we did have a question, just a request about sharing the title of the habit book again. Oh yeah, it's just, yeah. Um, you know what, I lent mine out and someone stole it, but it's simply called The Power of Habit. Um, and if, while we're online, I will just look it up very quickly, but I know it's that, but I'll find you the author number very quickly. It is in paperback, it's, it's a small yellow and red book, The Power Okay, it's coming up. Yeah, so it's The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Okay, Charles Duhigg, D-U-H-I-G-G. So simply The Power of Habit. And in fact, I'm going to quickly share my screen again with you and you can see what I'm looking at. Okay, here we go. Beauty of technology. Okay, sharing my screen. So this is, I just looked it up on, on uh, Safari. So here's The Power of Habit. Here's the book. Okay, I think that might come up. Here it is. Okay, The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business. Published, published back in January 2014. I've had it for a few years. Um, it's not very expensive. Paperback, you can get $8.99, but that's it. Okay, everyone got that? Charles Duhigg. Really, really good book. As I said, uh, one of uh, an array of books I get any coach or um, high performance director that I work with. Okay. So as I said, any questions you have, please, um, I'm here for you as much as I am for my, my own group. And, um, you know, I've been, I, I feel very fortunate to work with coaches and particularly age group coaches. You know, I've spent a career more with the, the winter sports uh, high performance group. But um, as I said, I sincerely respect age group coaches all the way through and age group programs because it is fraught with difficulty of the myriad of things you have to consider at the national team level the senior level i tell you it's much easier it's far easier in terms of really what you have to think about the challenge is to get everyone to think about the few things that really are important rather than become too expansive the only other thing about the national team is you can get very very individualistic which is actually what's needed okay so that's their challenge as opposed to to us in the trenches okay so, Steve, one of the one of the things that have come out of the of the other sessions that we've done is at the end, we tend to ask uh, if you have a recommended title or book or a podcast. And one of the questions that we just got was from Susanna Escobar. She wanted to know if you had a preferred title on biomechanics. You know what? That's a difficult one because there are very good books but some of them suddenly sort of get very complex very quickly. And so I would ask the, actually ask the question of Alan, if you haven't already on biomechanics, because, you know, um, I've been lucky to have been immersed. In fact, my, under, my undergraduate, I was at the Chelsea School of Human Movement at, the, at um, the University of Brighton way back, that's why I did my undergrad. And I, 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 I had, um, uh, a professor there who was a big biomechanist and did his master's with Larry Holt, Professor Larry Holt, very famous Canadian biomechanist at Dalhousie. And they were the first group that they would take plaster casts of Nancy Garapik's forearm and leg and all this type of stuff, put them in the wind tunnel. And they were some of the first, very first authors to look at sort of fluid dynamics, something that really has not been debunked, but certainly being, being challenged. And as I'm sure Alan's talked to you about the realities of understanding the difference between fixed objects in air or fluids, so air is a fluid, compared to multidimensional ones such as our swimmers, right? So that's why you can't just look at lift and drag elements from airplanes, boats, and, and race cars in the same way you look at swimmers. There are some basic tenants, you know, frontal drag and all that type of stuff, linear drag, Etc. Et surface track. Um, 
but so to answer your question, I don't know. I have to have a think about that. But I would ask Alan. But I, what I will do is I will look around to find something that I think is up to date. That's the challenge, um, because even if you read like, you know, I grew up, if you like, as the real books came in, I read Councilman's book, right? Science of Swimming, <laughs> pretty, pretty vague. But as you go back to it now, not that vague, actually. And uh, Swimming Fast and swimming faster and all that type of stuff as you came through the Maglisco era. And so he was reliant on the knowledge at the time, but we've seen evolve even further of which for me, the reason why I like Alan and Ryan so much is the way that which they put across the practical elements of really what you need to consider. And the slight differences between the strokes, even though you might use very, very sort of similar sort of global aspects. I know that, um, Alan will talk about body position, balance and rhythm, for example, across all three strokes. And they're remarkably similar, except when you get to breaststroke, of course. So um, that has some slight differences, but you're able to describe them in the same way. So um, I will have a think about that. I might even ask Alan if I'm not certain if he's still going to be speaking to you again, but certainly a question for him. But if that's one of the questions coming to us, I think that's a very important one, because I think we we do not spend enough time on biomechanics in this country. And that includes all the transition elements, the dive and transition component, the starts and turns. If you looked, if you looked at the Olympics, it's amazing. We can stratify clean swimming speed in the middle of the pool across the highest echelon swimmer and then everyone else. But interesting enough, everyone's clean swimming speed isn't that different from everyone else, right? There are some slight vagaries, you know, there's a sort of, but what really makes the difference is starts and transitions at the start, the approach to each turn, the actual turn execution and the transition out of it, right? And definitely the finish. I was appalled, appalled, even with the Canadians, that we have not taught even our best Canadians to actually understand that since they're largely the swimming on the surface or close to it, that the, that the fastest way is a straight line to the wall in front of them, to where the the stop pad is basically, which means that I'm, I'm doing a stupid version, but is to reach straight along that surface to the water. If you are diving down to touch the plat to touch the pad, that is a longer distance. OK, takes more time, even if it's only a few hundreds or reaching above the wall. OK, so one of the things is we 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 are throwing away time, certainly in our approaches to the wall certainly in the way we execute the turn and our transition off. And I think that, you know, here's the funny thing about that. You don't even have to swim that well to be able to do those things. You don't even have to be the fastest swimmer in the world to have the greatest start and transition. You don't have to be the greatest swimmer in the world to do a great turn necessarily. Although I, I will buy that you need to have a great approach speed. Don't get me wrong. Okay, but you understand what I'm saying? So we don't spend, so even as a physiologist, I'm fed up of all the crap we talk about energy systems, because it's actually very simple, okay? And where we see these polarized discussions occurring, and I'm very concerned about fad forms of training, and particularly fad forms of training that are applied to all age groups, because I just told you that the underlying genetic matrix, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't apply itself well through all the age groups, right? From an energy system point of view, from even a biomechanics point of view. So you have to be careful. Okay, you're getting me off topic here, but we will find out the answer for you. Will Suzanne answer that question? We, we will find an answer for you around what might be good. It's probably going to be an amalgam of books and maybe some websites, because I don't know of one that really has taken everything that, say, Alan teaches you and, and Ryan and other good ones around and put it in one place. That's, that's often the challenge a lot with really good knowledge. You have to go here and here and here and here to find out. And people don't necessarily put together good um, compendiums. What you often see is position statements. And I am very worried about position statements I see in academia, because usually what that means is you take a bunch of ideas and you come up with mediocrity in the middle. OK, even if you look at long term athlete developments, which across the world are all very, very similar. OK, everyone has their own bias and different language, but often as not them when they get boiled down, they get boiled down into. Uh, hmm, a lack of real opinion on what to do. So my view in many of the, the, the major topics is 
look at everything as much as you can it makes sense come up with your own ideas come up with your own position around it and if we need this is why i really want us to have fireside chats and have online webinars where we can really talk and discuss a particular point um because we need to we need to challenge each other on what we think and uh, and be open okay particularly since as i said you, you're not dealing with apples and apples and oranges in your apples and apples and apples in your swimming pools you're dealing with a whole basket of different fruit and veg right to any one moment in time you're gonna you've got to have different put tools in your back pocket to apply to this kid or that kid or that kid even though you're trying to solve the same they have maybe the same problem but the actual underlying circumstances for what is manifesting in front of you might be different and the way you're a going to explain it and b actually put into put into effect a drill or something to change that behavior could be quite different from one kid to the next frustrating as hell i know but that's the business you're in thanks steve uh just as you were saying you mentioned alan alan's not on our docket this uh particular period of time however oh, okay we, but 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 what you mentioned is the fortunate thing is that we have a human library in this country by alan wrigley by ryan atkinson by Amber Hutchison, and we will bring oh, that to the forefront. We will be bringing that to the forefront when we get back to somewhat of a, a, a semblance of, of, of movement forward where we can have in-person things, uh, get back to business, expand things out in our region, uh, our outreach pieces, and some of our in-reach pieces. So that, uh, it's a great reminder to that and really appreciate that. And uh, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to do a bit of a commercial break here of, of sorts or a reminder. You know, this virtual conference has been quite interesting. I know, Steve, you did a, you know, I think uh, Alberta Swimming did one over the weekend or a couple last couple of days. We, we we stretched ours out. We might have shot the shot the uh, one runway of sorts. This has been very much like uh, an Olympic or Paralympic format. Number of days, eight, nine, ten days, and there's always something coming, always something coming and looking back, but also looking forward. And just for that, uh, you know, we have three days, in fact, ahead of us. And I will just try and go through some sort of, uh, reminders of things. Tonight, eight, 7 to 8.30, Judy Rigi, she's a, uh, a fellow Albertan. Uh, you work close, I know you've worked with uh, uh, Judy. Her topic's on emerging better. We've had a few sessions with her already and have shaped things. Uh, tomorrow is September 30th, which is a national uh, day for truth and reconciliation. Uh, wear orange, take the time to understand and reflect. We will be acknowledging throughout the day. Uh, tomorrow as well, 12 to 1, there is a question and answer period with Judy Reek. This is not uh, recorded. This is just a, a real fireside chat virtually. And we had one yesterday afternoon. It was, it was very small, intimate in a lot of ways, but some good discussion points came out. 1 to 2.30, we have life skills and the appropriate athlete development. Suzanne Pollan, Swimming Canada, and Dr. Vic, Vicky Harbour, you mentioned that earlier and in and around that, very much a part of the delivery of what, what is happening. Uh, we'll call it a, a up, an up, up uh, swing of things, uh, a 2.0 version or whatever, but something to become. And we, we first uh, purposely sell, settled on the life skills piece, almost that human, a human approach and things like that. Uh, 7 to 8.30, busy evening. We have Resourcefulness Matters for Your Athlete by Melinda Harrison. Maybe a direct line for uh, parents, but definitely for coaches. So we have that going on. At the same time, Masters, grow the program within your program. Uh, maybe give up a little bit of that, uh, uh, those four sessions a week for your eight-year-olds and maybe think about the Swim for Life Swimming uh, Continuum piece, something of that nature. And we do have an official session. Friday, we have an Olympic and Paralympic panel, the reflection, and that will, um, the reflection to, uh, of the Tokyo 2020 uh, journey. Mark Perry, Wayne Lomas, and Ian McDonald will be available to um, have some discussion. At one o'clock, we have our award ceremony. Yes, this, uh, this past season, we haven't been able to, uh, uh, you know, identify and address some of the awards that normally would take place. Uh, we do have some. But we are uh, doing those, recognizing where we can recognize. And then we'll shift, and, and, and I'll use the word pivot, <laughs> shift more or less, uh, uh, to recognizing and paying tribute to the wonderful performances of our Paralympic uh, swimmers 
and our Olympic swimmers. And I have to tell you, and I may be a bit biased on this, I've seen the sneak preview of, of, uh, of this and it's quite good. And I do believe that clubs will be able to use that as that recruitment retention, uh, just as a, a standalone piece to try and share with your swimmers and your parents. So I do, uh, and that's at one o'clock, it'll be ready to launch, it's pre-recorded. Seven o'clock to eight o'clock tomorrow night is an add-on. It is around a, 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 a burning topic, uh, the vaccine mandate. We will, we've will we been investing heavily with our legal advisors. And uh, when I say investing heavily, it, it is. Uh, the, the dollar signs are there, but it's worthwhile because it's a very important piece to move forward. Very important to try and um, uh, be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. So there is a question and answer with our with our legal advisor of Aaron Durant, seven to eight. Hopefully, a lot of your club administrators, uh, presidents, have received that notice. Saturday, the final day, eleven to twelve thirty, is a reflection of the Tokyo Pathway for the athletes and uh, and and uh, mostly the athletes so we have Ryan um, Malat and Vicky Keith doing the uh, moderating but we have Abby Tripp Matthew Cabrera we have Josh Lando we have Finley Knox and we have Katrina uh, Bellio as some of the ones that will be reflecting on that one o'clock will be closing remarks and Bell the president of Swim Ontario myself but the nice thing is we have a great uh, uh, delivery for you from Stephanie Dixon uh, swimmer, um, Paralympic swimmer, uh, with a huge background to her. Uh, she was the chef de mission for the Paralympic uh, Games this summer. She has a message for us. And then from there, we move to seven o'clock, where it will be launched a pre, uh, pre-recorded um, uh, Ontario Aquatics Hall of Fame uh, for Murray Drudge and Kevin Thorburn, who left us way too soon, but never forgotten. And I just want to say is that most of the time through these sessions that we've created from last Friday all the way through, it's mainly been coaches. And we, we would hope that some of the administrators will get caught up. I really implore everyone to take the time with your staff, with your administrators, with your club leaders, and walk through some of these deliverables that was given this. There's lots to unpack. And, uh, but we do feel it's very, very valuable. Uh, a little less on the technical delivery of things, more a little bit more on the human skills the human side of things that will help frame how we can re- reimagine Ontario swimming uh, uh, further down the road and do it together. Uh, we, uh, as we were talking, Steve, the uh, staff that's on the call, we were uh, doing a bit of a text back and forth. We call it the corner office idea pieces. Whenever we do get uh, inspired and motivated, and uh, which is quite often when we have leaned on our partners, our performance partners throughout has helped us create some things and we just have to find the bandwidth to deliver it. But we do have some things that uh, are definitely in the hopper to make things better for more, uh, to spread uh, the information, to give that uh, little extra for the clubs and the coaches and the regions to actually lift the game and uh, emerge better. So Steve, thank you very much for your time. All the best on your travels. Enjoy your time with your mother. And uh, Stu, thanks for very much for always monitoring and Lindsay in the background as always and everybody else hopefully see you on the screen over the next three days thank you very much